Um, I'd love you to turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Wait till everybody's got it there. Verse 1. Then Jesus, this was after he was baptized, he was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted, or it can also read tested by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Just let's stop a moment. Father, as we're reading this, speak to our hearts, we pray. Give us open hearts and open minds to receive your word, we pray. Speak to us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The tempter came to him and said, if you are, if you are the, God, the devil always tries to tempt you to, be, to prove that you're somebody who you already are. You don't have to prove you're a son of God. You're already a son of God. If you weren't a son of God, the devil wouldn't try to tempt you to prove that you are a son of God. Tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the, uh, to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they'll lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written. It is also written. Do not, see, it's funny how the devil quotes scripture. It's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Don't try to force God to act. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, it is written, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Luke's account of this reverses the last two of those temptations. Not that it matters. It doesn't matter. When I think of temptation, uh, well, first of all, I think of somebody who said, uh, uh, he said, my uncle, my uncle, he died, you know, yeah, he died. And this guy said, uh, well, well, how did he die? He said, well, he, he fell into a vat of whiskey and he drowned. And his friend said, oh, that must have been a terrible way to die. He said, oh, I don't know. He said, he, he got out three times to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> That's temptation. I also heard of a lady who worked in an office and she was just getting plumper and plumper and she just loved her cream cakes and chocolate cakes. And one day she decided she wasn't going to have any more cakes. And so uh, <laughs> they, she said, I'm not going to buy any more cakes because there's a cake shop on the way to work. I'm not going to buy any more. And they said, well, the best thing to do is not go past the cake shop. That's it. Go around the other side. Don't go past the cake shop. So... Weeks went by and she didn't have any cakes and she was doing really, really well. And one day, she came to work with a massive big chocolate cake. My friend says, I thought you weren't going to buy any more cakes. She said, oh, no, it's, it's not quite like that. She said, I woke up this morning and I, I thought, I, I, I don't know, I thought maybe the Lord's, I'll test, I'll tra I'll test this. So she she drove, she decided to drive past the cake shop and she said, Lord, if you want me to have a cake, there'll be a car park right outside the cake shop. She said, and sure enough, on my fifth time around the block, there was the car park. <laughs> we can find many ways to get around temptation. The thing is, what I really am trying to say is that when I think of temptation, I think of those sorts of temptations. There's all the temptations that, you know, like you think of sexual temptations, you think of temptations to steal or to retaliate in anger, all the, the, the active type things. This, is, this shows you something today, that what we're looking at today are certain principles which cover everything. I'll come to that 
and a little bit later. Now, um, remember this. You as Christians are not tempted because you are evil. You're tempted because you are good. Jesus had just been baptized, as it were, filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized in water, and he was led to be tempted. Don't be surprised if you're tested and tempted. It's an ordinary part of the Christian life. Get used to it. Take it on. That's so important. Now, we think that Jesus, well, he was God and, you know, he, he wouldn't have felt temptation the way we felt feel temptation. That's so not true. He was fully God, but he was also fully man. Hebrews 2.17, he was made like his brothers in every way. Jesus was made like you in every way except without sin, in every respect. He was tempted like as we are, I'm quoting scripture, yet without sin. The temptations he, ex he received were real temptations. And his total defense against temptation was, three times, it is written. Now that's a problem. Not every Christian can say this. Um, I don't know if these stats are true. I just got them from the net. But 80% of so-called Christians don't read their Bible every day. 2% a bit. 19% do read their Bible every day. 2% a bit. In America, 22% read their Bible a little bit each day. 35% never pick it up. I talk about Christians. That's a third. Um, and the good news is, this is good news, 1% read it more than once a day. So it's very hard for a lot of Christians to say it is written. Biblical illiteracy is rampant in many churches today and yet it's absolutely vital it sounds so simplistic almost sunday school for the pastor to get up and say to the church read your bible read your bible every day sometimes more than once a day get to know the word of god jesus he used the word of god as a sword stabbed satan as it were with the sword and notice this, every time Jesus said, it is written, Satan had no response. People seem to have these long-running battles with the devil. Seems to go on for and ever and ever. They could end the battle by saying, it is written. Deal with it. It is written. This is what God's word says. <clears throat> now, what, um, what it was that... Uh, brought me to preaching on this is this week is because of the reading that Heather and I have been having in 2 Kings uh, and we're on chapter 18 from chapter 18 quite a few chapters actually uh, when the king of Assyria sends a massive army with the uh, field commander who's called Rabshakeh to, to Jerusalem to capture Jerusalem and to, to carry off all the inhabitants and to, to, to uh, pillage the whole of the city now that army had to be more than 200,000. I'll explain why. We know that. So when you've got somewhere like 200,000 warriors outside your city, that could be a problem. Especially when the army, the first place they go to is, is called the aqueduct or the conduit at the upper pool. So just outside of Jerusalem, there's an aqueduct or was and a conduit. And it was... It, it supplied water for the washerman's field. It supplied water for the city. It supplied water for the people to wash and to drink. And the first place the enemy went to was the water supply. Now, you don't need to be a theological genius to understand the first thing that the enemy will try and cut off from your life is, is the most important thing that you wash in and you drink. That is the word of God. That's the water of the word, excuse me, <clears throat> the word of God. That's what he wants to cut off. 
Now, Rab Shakai, the field commander, stood and shouted to, well, actually, he called out the elders of the city, the, the secretary and all, all the important officials of the city. But he, 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 he called them out on the walls and he shouted to them and he said to them, this, uh, well, I'm going to capture this place. Have any of the other gods stopped us from capturing them, from destroying their cities? And he listed all the gods and all the nations and all the cities that he had destroyed. He said, this God that you're depending on won't help you. Anyway, he was the one who sent us here to destroy you anyway. And the, the people listening said, don't talk to, don't talk to us in, 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 in Hebrew. The other people can hear you. Talk to us in Aramaic. Goes to show how educated these people were. Here's an Assyrian, speaks fluent Assyrian, speaks fluent Aramaic and fluent Hebrew. They weren't stupid. Well, that wasn't going to happen. And of course, they told Hezekiah about it. And they have a letter and he lays it out before the Lord. Isaiah prophesied that the city was not going to be taken. But the thing is this, the gist of the letter of Rabshakeh to Hezekiah was, don't trust in God. Don't trust in Egypt, he says. They're, they're, they're like a, a splintering reed. When you lean on them, it splinters and goes into your hand. Don't trust in your God. We've killed all the other gods. We've destroyed them. Don't trust in God. That's the message of Rabshakeh to Hezekiah. Now, we, all, we know what happened at the very end of the story. The angel of the Lord goes out one night and wipes out 185,000 Assyrians. That's how we know it was a large army. And we read, when they woke up in the morning, this is the authorised version, behold, they were all dead men. I don't know how you can wake up and say, oh, we're all dead. But, so there must have been probably about 15,000 left. Woke up in the morning and went, my goodness, look at that, 185,000. Rabshakeh went back. And the king of Assyria, who could have been there, might not have been there, but he was later on killed. The battle goes on continually in the Old Testament with Jerusalem and other nations coming against it. But the gist of the message that the enemy will bring to you after he blocks off your water supply is don't trust God. How convenient is that? Don't trust in God. So there's, there is no greater demonstration of that in the New Testament than this temptation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how does it apply to you? Well, it's not just a matter of this, this temptation, that temptation. There's much bigger principles involved than that. You see, temptation is all about your relationship with God. It's all about whether you can trust God. That's the center of temptation. Don't trust God. Don't trust God for it. Don't trust God for anything. Don't trust God. That's what the heartbeat of these temptations were. Do it yourself. Now, these things that happened to Jesus weren't just sort of theological or theoretical or hypothetical. They were real. He hadn't eaten for six weeks or drunk any water. This, is, this involves pain. A lot of people don't understand temptation because they don't resist temptation. If you don't resist temptation, there's no pain. Resisting temptation involves pain sometimes. These things were very real. They were concrete realities. It was bread. Something to eat. He was hungry. It involves things like, why am I waiting so long? Is something ever going to happen? See, this is bigger than simply, I stole it. You know, when I first got saved, we had some of the most nonsensical, inane meetings I've ever been to when people got up and discussed whether it was right to, to, to steal a pencil from work. Should Christians take pencils from work? Oh, I don't think you should do that, boy. Oh, that's very evil, very wrong. I don't think God is in the business of counting pencils very much, to be honest with you. It's, there's nothing more important than coming to a place in your life when nothing's happening. Is God being silent to me? There's, why isn't this person being healed? Why isn't this? Why isn't, why isn't this? See, you're being tempted 
Not always, but tempted to not trust God. What, what is God doing? Why? I don't understand what's happening in this. And then comes the beginning of false doctrine. And it comes with this little phrase. There must be a reason for it. Oh, have you heard that before? There must be some reason that this is not happening. There must be a reason. God's not going to do it. Provide it for yourself. That's the first temptation. Make these stones into bread. Look at these little stones. They look like little loaves of bread. Why not just make them into bread? Why not just satisfy your hunger? Why trust God? Nothing's happening. He's not going to do anything about it. And that's the temptation to act independently from God. To not bring God into the scenario. You're never so safe as when you are asking God for help, for guidance, for wisdom, for courage. And, and, and you're acknowledging God in all your ways. All your ways. We had a lecture at Bible college. This is, this is nearly 50 years ago, but we don't forget this. When he said to the students, what do you do when you acknowledge somebody? There's somebody walking across the road down there, and there's a, and there's a guy actually walking just down there. And I, if, he, if, he, if he could see me, I'd go, oi, and wave. And he'd probably go, oi, I've acknowledged him. It doesn't say have five days of fasting and prayer and intercession before you go out and buy something from the shops. It says, whatever you're doing, just acknowledge God. One of the loveliest things we found is no matter what we're doing, we, we often say, we say this a lot, Lord, um, when we go here, please give us grace and favor. And it's amazing. Like Bonnie, the police officer helping her fix her phone. Those little things happen when you acknowledge God in those things. Now, Jesus um, quoted... These scriptures are all from the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus quoted more from the book of Deuteronomy than any other book in the Old Testament. Why? Well, Israel was 40 years. He was 40 days and 40 nights. They were 40 years in the wilderness. And the scripture says they tested. They were being tested. They were being tested in the wilderness. And so you've got Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Uh, Deuteronomy 6 13. It is written, you shall serve the Lord thy God, and him only shall you worship. 6 16. Do not test the Lord your God. Don't put your God to the test. Don't try to force God to act as it were. And of course, the first man, Adam, was tested in an uh, idyllic situation in the Garden of Eden in perfect circumstances. And the second Adam was tested in a wilderness. This wilderness is actually called Jeshimon, and it means terrible. And I won't go into details, but I've read all about it, where it was leading to the Dead Sea and uh, you know, what, sort of, what it looked like, what the weather was like. I read all that, but that's not the point. It was a terrible place to be for 40 days and 40 nights without food and water. But what's interesting is that when Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The Greek there, there's the word on, every on. It's actually upon. It means based upon. It's an interesting thought. More than interesting. It means that everything should be based upon the word of God. So it means everything means every government, every country, every leadership, every council, every society, every school, every institution, every family, every marriage, every business. Everything should be based on the word. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word which is based upon the word of God. Its foundation is the word of God. That's what we're to live by. So it's not necessarily a matter of thinking, oh, the devil's having a go at me. I better find a text to stab him with. It's no, your whole life. Your whole, this is the foundation of your whole life. Your thinking, your being, who you are, your family. Fancy, an, a, fancy a Christian marrying a non-Christian and then trying to base their whole marriage upon the word of God. It speaks for itself. But you say, oh, yeah, this, is, this temptation didn't seem, doesn't seem right to me because I couldn't change, I couldn't change uh, stones into bread. So how, this, how can this apply to me? Well, haven't you ever been 
tempted to provide for yourself? I didn't say legitimately, but illegitimately. We've all got to provide for ourselves. I mean, you don't need prayer to get in your car and go to the garage and get some petrol or go to the shop and buy a pie. Those are things you just commit your day to the Lord, but there are certain things, certain things which are, can be quite monumental, important in your life. Those are the things where the temptation comes in. Legitimate things, but to do things illegitimately, and that is to provide for yourself apart from God. And what happens, I wonder if you'll find yourself in this list I've written down. You may say to yourself, well, I can borrow it, or I can take it, no one would know. Or I can manipulate for it, or I can beg for it, or I can just do it and blow the circumstances, the, the, the cons consequences. Well, I can get it somehow, and it's not fair that I don't have this, or that's working out like this. I want it to be like that. And also, I deserve it. Well, there's nothing wrong in having it. There's nothing wrong in it. But what does God say? I know a man who committed adultery, heaven knows him, who said to his wife and then actually said to us when he was questioned about it, he said, well, a man's got needs, hasn't he? And that was it. A man's got needs. Oh, I knew it was right to leave my wife because it just felt so right. It was just, I knew it was right to leave my husband because the, 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 the guy I met, we just, we were like soul brothers. I knew I was with the wrong person and this was the person. I knew I, it felt so right. Once again, we're not worshipping at the throne of the, 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 the living God and at the word of God. We're living by circumstances. We're living by our needs, our lusts, our desires, our appetites, not what the word of God tells us. See, what Jesus is saying in this, when he's, he's saying to the enemy here, he says, I will not complain. I will not take matters into my own hands. My father has not willed me to immediately have bread, but I will trust him at his word. Oh, I love that. I will trust God. I've so enjoyed our worship this morning. I will trust God. Though he slays me, still will I trust him, Joe said. I will trust him. I will trust him. Nothing would make Jesus not trust God. Nothing. Rather die than not trust God. When Abraham offered up his son Isaac, he didn't know that God was going to give him back and intervene with an angel. He said, I'm going to do this. There's only one way this is going to work out because this boy, Isaac, is the vestibule of all the promises of God for the whole world. And God wants me to kill him. He must be able to raise him from the dead. I'm going to trust God, even though I don't understand. That's the first lesson. The second lesson, well, I find this absolutely, this has really sl slain me this week, and I'll, I'll explain. He takes him to the highest point of the temple. It was on the edge of the Kidron Valley, and it was four, a 450-foot drop. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, he will give his angels charge over you unless you dash your foot against a stone. If you're the son of God, prove it. Show it. Now you say, well, how does this apply to me? It might not. You see, what it does apply to, especially, and I can only minister to you out of the grill of my own vocation in life, and that applies especially to ministers. Prove yourself. Show yourself. Authenticate yourself. You hear that? Authenticate yourself. I was saying to Heather this week that, um, see, over the years, I, I've, I've been in ministry for 50 years. And I, I remember the first few years I came out of college and I thought, gosh, if I went back and the, to those young students who, were, who are there now getting ready to go into the ministry, I'd say this to them. 
This is what I've learned. I'd say this and I'd say this. So as the years have gone by, I, I, I've always wanted to go back and say to, stu to students, listen, learn this, learn this, learn that. That's important. But if I was to go back now, I would somehow manage, by the grace of God, to minister for one month on this subject, on these verses of Scripture. Let me show you what I mean. Ministers are watched with certain scepticism, especially by the world. Not so much the church. The church, love trusts, love believes. But there's always a temptation to prove yourself. Particularly people with ministries. Prove that you're called of God. You should have people being saved in your meetings. Prove that, you're, prove that you're anointed of God. You should be able to blow on people and get them to fall over. Prove that you've got a, a ministry. Heal people. Prove that you've got the power of the Spirit. Oh, you, you need to build a church somewhere along the line as well, which is the biggest trap I ever fell into. If ever I could have relived my life, that's one thing I would never attempt to do again. I didn't attempt to do it. I achieved it. But I was too ill. Prove yourself. And if God doesn't act, do what I heard a minister say once when I was in New South Wales. He said, if the Holy Spirit doesn't move, I'll force him to move. I was in the front row when he said it. I could weep at that. You can't force God. You don't have to prove yourself. If God has called you to do something. And the greatest evidence of that is those who are obsessed with power ministries and miracles. Because that's where their faith depends. Their faith depends on doing things and seeing things. Now I know the gospel came in power. And still work comes in miracles. I've seen that. I've received that. I was a recipient of that. And God does do miracles and does do power. But these people never move on from that. They're stuck there. They are cons constantly looking for demonstrations and evidence. Excuse me if I stick to my notes, but uh, I, I, I'm, it's important I get this the way I, I, I wrote it. The way I saw it, the way I felt it when I wrote it. That what was in my heart. There is no desire to hear God's word about sanctification, holiness, marriage, quiet, peace, prayer, suffering, relationships, the inner life. No, it's do something. Do something. Prove yourself. See, this is, this is the temptation of Jesus. Do something spectacular and everybody will believe you. You don't have to wait for years and years and years to authenticate your ministry. You can do it yourself. You can get miracles happening. and Everybody will bow down to you and think how absolutely wonderful. You're a man of faith. Prove it. But no, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. Thank God for peace. Now, I've been in riotous meetings and had a great time. I've, I promise you I've seen it all, especially in America. I've been there, done that, had a great time. But that's not normal Christianity. Nowhere near it. And I've seen, and I was thinking about certain people when I, I wrote this, the strain and anxiety on their faces. And I know something about the strain in their marriages and how that's something that they never seem to be able to deal with because they're so busy with their healing ministries. And so busy with their demon hunting ministries. Now, I know I'm not going to make a lot of friends saying this, especially publicly. 
But I don't find anywhere in the Bible where people had those specific ministries and just went around spending their whole lives dealing with those things. God will bless people who do it. He will still bless it. He will still bless people who do it. But there's much more important things than some of the things that people are majoring on and missing out on those, the peace and the relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ, of knowing him in a peaceful, intimate way, of bringing up your family in peace, enjoying your wife or husband, enjoying the Christian life and your brothers and your sisters. Satan is not interested in the will of God or the ways of God. That's why he misquoted the scripture. You're the Messiah? Stand on the edge of the temple and jump off. It is written. Satan said, it is written. He'll give his angels charge over you to keep you. Didn't say that. He said, he'll give his angels charge over you, listen, to keep you in all your ways. His way was God's way. Are we interested in what is God's will? What is God's way? What is God's purpose in all that is happening in our lives? So that's Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12. So he leaves God, Satan leaves God out of the picture. God's ways. You see, that's what temptation is, my friend. It's to have significance, self-authentication, and independence, and have all these things away from God. Away from God, apart from God. How about step out in faith? Well, that's a 450-foot drop, and this one doesn't end in the Valley of Kidron. It ends in the bowels of hell to live any of your life without God. That's what the temptation was, not to trust in God, to live your life without God. And, you know, some people rationalize their disobedience. They say, well, um, that would be a good idea. I did that. I've done that. To, I think it would be a good idea to serve the Lord like this. I'll do this and do that. And I fell on my face a number of times. Jesus says in John 5, 19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. He says in John 5, 19, I do nothing on my own authority. There's where the minister goes wrong. There's where I've go, gone wrong. There's where young ministers can go wrong. To be obsessed with everything except the way of God, the will of God, the work of God becomes primary and the will of God becomes secondary. Finally, finally, if you're the son of God, I'll give you all of this. It took him to a high. I read one scholar the other day. He said, this can't be literally because there's no hill high enough. Well, it's not necessarily a hill like a hill around here, it was simply that he took him up to a high hill. It doesn't say where. could have been Mount Everest for all we know. But he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Well, no hill, no matter high, how high it is, is going to allow you to see all the kingdoms of the, of the world. So it's something that happened in the spirit, in the spiritual realm. And he saw all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, I'll give you all of this if you bow down and worship me. Now, I'm just going to read to you some terrible words for the future. Revelation 13, verse 8. You see, worship is Satan's lust. That's his greatest need. Satan aches to be worshipped. He longs to be worshipped. By the way, if you get a Christian and he spends his whole life 
chasing Satan, so he ends up knowing the names of more demons than the names than the names of God, and spends more time casting out demons and more time studying demons and stuff. Then he's spending more time worshiping Satan than he is God. He knows more about the devil than he does the Lord Jesus Christ. That's rare, but it has happened. Listen to these terrible words. Revelation 13, 8. All the inhabitants of the world will worship the beast. But thank God it doesn't stop there. Whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life. Belonging to the Lamb who was slain before the creation of the world. You won't. No one who belongs to God possibly will. Now, when, Jesus, when, when Satan said, I'll give you all of these, it was his to give. I just settled that once and for all. People say, oh, well, he didn't own them all. You know. No, they were his to give. The reason I say that is because, first of all, Jesus three times called Satan the ruler of this world. That says a lot. Paul calls him the prince of the power of the air and he calls him, with a small g, the god of this world. The god of this world. Jesus never said to Satan, well, that's not much of a temptation. Can't you come up with something better than that? You're lying because it's not yours to give. It would have been no temptation if it wasn't Satan's to give. That finalizes the issue once and for all. What? What Satan was saying to Jesus was, betray yourself. Like Judas, he was called the betrayer. Now the embodiment of evil is to, is to be a person who has turned away from God. Who wants to have this world without any pain, any problems, any difficulties, any suffering, wants everything to go smooth and wonderful, and Christianity is not on their list because it's too much of a hassle and too much of a bother. And that person lives totally for themselves. 100% for themselves. What Satan was saying is this. I can give you the whole world... And it won't cost you anything. Oh, just a moment. About. You see, that phrase there, if you will worship me, in the Greek means just once. It didn't, he wasn't saying, Jesus, I want you to keep on worshipping me. Just do it. No one's watching. No one's around. No one will see you. Just fall down and worship me once. And you'll get all this and there'll be no pain. No sorrow, no difficulties, you'll have the whole lot. Do it my way, not God's way. Just once. Now you say to me, surely no one would forsake God for this spinning globe, for all this tinsel, uh, flotsam, jetsam, you can't compare it all. Well, let me remind you of some words in Scripture. 2 Timothy 4.10 Demas has forsaken me. He has deserted me, having loved this present world. That's what was beginning to fill his mind, to fill his horizon, as it were, this world had gradually crept back into his life and he was being tempted and he eventually succumbed and forsook the Apostle Paul and the work of God for this present. Those are terrible words. Those are terrible words. They really are. Well, you say, um, um, that siren... Still sing softly today. I'm tempted, but, uh, but there's one way. There's only one way, by the way, you can overcome this. And that is this. You'll only love the world 
if you don't love God. You'll only love the world if you don't love God. If you love God, you won't love the world. In fact, I would say this, the more you love the God, our God, the less you'll love the world. If you're satisfied with God, there's no chance you're going to backslide. It's if you're dissatisfied with God. <laughs> Fancy saying to Jesus, bow down and worship me and I'll give you all of this. It must have been a brilliant vision that he showed Jesus. It must have been wonderful what he saw. Or it wouldn't have been a temptation. Before I got saved, I understood that temptation. Everybody wanted to be somebody. I wanted to be in the music sphere and, you know. The world's attraction for the unsaved is insatiable. But for the Christian, gradually it loses its luster. It fades and fades and fades. And there's less and less and less to be tempted for. And the less you're going to love the world, the more you're going to love God. I'm closing. Jesus had to be rejected. He had to be betrayed. He had to be beaten. He had to be mocked and scorned and spat on and crucified carrying your sin and my sin, carrying the weight of sorrow and the punishment of being forsaken by God. Whatever that meant in that hour, whatever he endured there, we'll have an inkling of it in eternity. Right now, we just don't really understand. What Satan was saying to, to Jesus constantly in these temptations was, you don't have to. You don't have to go that way. You don't have to go that way. Constantly Satan is saying to God's people, you don't have to do that. Even down to what it must be like on a snowy morning when you're all wrapped up in bed and the voice says, you don't have to get up and go to church. You don't have to offer that person hospitality. You don't have to be. You don't have to give. You don't have to be kind. You don't have. This, listen. A lot of what we do, we don't have to do, but we do it. And when we do it, we've resisted temptation by doing the will of God. No, but you don't have to. But you don't have to. Um, I'll close with this thought. Martin Luther. The great reformist was once asked how he overcame the devil. How would you overcome the devil? Well, he said, when he comes knocking on the door of my heart and asks, who lives here? The dear Lord Jesus goes to the door and says, Martin Luther used to live here, but he's moved out. Now I live here. <laughs> when Christ fills our hearts, Satan has no entrance. When Christ fills your heart, Satan has no entrance. You won't be tempted to live without God. You won't be tempted to not trust God. You won't be tempted to self-authenticate yourself and make yourself significant without God. You already are significant. The whole of heaven's attention is on you this morning. Angels, principalities and powers are watching you, as Paul says. You're being observed to see how you react, to see what you're like, what you're really like under pressure. Let Jesus fill every empty space of your heart and there'll be no room for you to be tempted in the way that our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted. Let's pray together. Father, we pray you'll fill us with the Holy Spirit. Thank you that when Jesus went into that temptation, he was full of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Lord. Thank you he emerged triumphant even after fasting 40 days and 40 nights without food or water. What sort of person are you, Lord Jesus? Thank you that you're the second Adam, the last Adam, and you came and redeemed and reclaimed a fallen world, Father. And we thank you and praise you. We ask for each one of us today, Lord, that you'll fill us with the Holy Spirit. 
Deliver us from temptation, we pray, according to your word, Lord. We pray that Jesus will be glorified in all our lives, Father. Amen. And amen.